and thanks for coming. Uh, today I'm going to talk a little about Rails and how awesome it is. And I think part of why it is so awesome and why it's great is its community and the huge ecosystem around it. And when I try to explain Rails to newcomers to the industry or even colleagues, I think of Rails about like this city map, this huge massive city map. It's it's big and consists of different areas, like over there is the active record district and there's the initializer town and all these things. And in our day-to-day -day work, it can feel kind of intimidating sometimes even. Like you're surrounded by all this functionality and you don't know what's happening and you feel constrained sometimes even. And while it's true that Rails has its certain ways and patterns how things should be done, this does not mean that we cannot find or create our own little areas of freedom. And today I'm going to talk about some of the areas we explored at 8th Light in order to help us work in a more efficient way with Rails. So at the beginning I want to talk a little bit about the status quo, then we talk a little bit of, about breaking of some things, um, followed by a quick wrap up about general application architecture, and then talking about some of the trade-offs. So, quick question to the round. Who here knows status quo? Couple of hands, all right, cool. So in contrast to Rails, status quo had a very simplistic approach. They always only played with three chords. And while I'm not going to continue today to talk about the band status quo, I thought coming here from London, I should at least take off a British reference. So we're done with that. We continue with the actual status quo as in the current state of affairs. Two years ago, DHH mentioned at uh, RailsConf um, that Rails for him is his proper pack. Like, if the world ends tomorrow, he still wants to be able to use Rails in order to write web applications. And I think this is a really cool feature and idea behind it because like, everything comes with Rails. Like, batteries included, you can continue or you can start writing web applications without the need of anything else. I'm more of a ultralight backpacking person myself. And while I'm not prepared for the zombie apocalypse, I always have just enough gear with me for my current adventure. And this is reflected in the Pareto principle, mostly known also as the 80-20 rule. So for example, 80% um, of your users use only 20% of your product's um, functionality. Or in Rails case, 80% of Rails applications out there use only 20% of what Rails offers as features. And the background of this talk um, has something to do with Omakasa Rails applications. And the throughout several years and having done a couple of Rails projects, we felt the same pain over and over again. And that is that Omakasa Rails applications lead to slow test suites. And this is a problem for us at 8th Light uh, because we are used to quick TDD cycles. We want to be able to write a little code, run the test suite to get feedback immediately. So this writing a little code and running the test happens, I don't know, five to six times a minute. Sometimes if I'm typing sloppy, 10 times. And I want this fast and quick feedback loop. Unfortunately, the bigger your Rails code base grows, if you follow the regular um, Omakasa style, you lose out on these things. And in a previous application where we uh, felt the pain and it was the last application we built in this way, um, this will be our reference application for throughout this talk. And we ended the project with around about 4,800 tests and the full test suite ran in about six minutes. And waiting six minutes until you know whether uh, refactoring worked or not is too long in my opinion. So I need my code base malleable in order to make a quick decision, yep, okay, this refactoring worked, continue, this bug is fixed or it's not fixed. I wanna get this feedback really, really quick. So after having seen that throughout a couple of projects, we went back to the drawing board, put on our thinking hats and started to really dig into what is the actual issue. And this is me with my thinking hat on. And one hotspot we identified was the Rails Buddha process. 
um, which looks roughly like this at the beginning, the Rails framework is loaded, then it will load all the dependencies from your gem file, and then it kicks off its initialized bang process, which loads all the code from all configured Rails engine, and so on and so forth. And during that process, um, something like uh, called eager loading, or it's in the docs it's called or referred to as eager loading, kicks in. And eager loading um, requires or is responsible for requiring all code that is inside your app directory, for example. And we started to modify our configuration a little bit. And in a typical Rails application, you see in the application.rb, you see a line like this, require Rails all, require the whole world, and continue. So we changed that a little bit in order to only require the two rail ties or the two frameworks we actually needed for this particular application, which was only action controller and sprockets for asset management. Um, turned out, which I learned after we did this change, that there's also already support for this kind of um, configuration by Rails new. If you run Rails new with a minus minus help flag, you get a list of all configuration options you can provide there. And it actually allows you to uh, skip a couple of plugins already. And um, you see there, skip active record, skip action cable. If you don't need them, you can already tell Rails, hey, don't generate the new project with these dependencies because I don't need them. And I did run the, this command with a minus minus skip test because I usually use RSpec for my testing. So what Rails new generates then is an application.rb uh, that looks like this. It doesn't require Rails all anymore, only Rails, which is the bare minimum. And then it actually tells you, hey, pick the frameworks you want, pick and choose. Um, and it commented out the um, test unit Rails type already for me because I was skipping that in the previous step. So that's good and well. The next thing after requiring the, um, the initial plugins, um, there's a line that will look like this. Bundler require Rails groups um, in Previous versions of Rails, it looked a little bit different. It required the default and then the Rails env. Um, it has been changed, I don't know in which version, but this tells Bundler to require all gems from your gem file for your current environment. The problem with that is that this line will add a linear load time to your boot process, which means the more gems you add, uh, the more time will be spent when you load up your application. And this is unfortunately a hard fact and a hard truth we need to accept. There, at the moment, there is no way around that. Um, so we continued. There are a couple of more settings we started to tweak. And one of them is um, active support supports a bear flag in order to say, hey, don't load everything from active support, but only the um, dependencies that are actually needed in order to boot up Rails. Um, and then there are two more settings, cache classes, in order to yeah, keep, keep a class cache. If the class has been loaded, keep it loaded. And then we disable specifically the dependency loading. And this is because at that time, um, we were big fans of a thing called streaming architecture, which I will go to, uh, which we will come back to um, at a later point at the presentation, but as a quick heads up. Streaming architecture, the idea behind that was that it should be obvious for a new person on your team that to know by just looking at the directory structure what kind of application is it. And if you take the Rails code base as an example, if you generate a new Rails code base, you see app bin config db lib public, and I don't know what domain is represented in this um, particular application. Just because I've seen Rails before, I have an idea, yep, that seems like a Rails app. And if we uh, drill down a little bit in the app directory, there are even more subdirectories which do not really reveal the intent behind the application itself. So what we started doing is we moved everything that was in app into the lib directory with a proper namespace. So in this example, there was it was a movie organization application. So there you can see there's an edit index and show um, ERB template. There is a movie model, a movie repository, and also the movie controller. Like everything that used to be an app, we moved to lib. We deleted the app directory altogether. Um, and in order to really make sure that nothing will be eagerly or auto-loaded or looked up anywhere, there are a couple of more settings for the application.rb. We made sure, okay, eager load, false, don't try to load anything. And we made sure don't even try to look up any path because we pretty much nulled them. 
by and feed them. Um, all good and well until here. So we booted up our REST application, no errors whatsoever. Trying to hit the index page, blew up with an exception, uninitialized constant movies controller. So I mentioned before, Rails expects um, everything to be loaded up front. This is why this preloading or eager loading happens in, in the first place. So now Rails can't find our, um, our application controller anymore. Luckily for us, there is a thing called lazy loading to the rescue for us. And what we did there, um, in the stack trace, you can see a call to active support constantize. So at that time, Rails tries to constantize a controller name based on the route definition we provided there. So because Ruby is flexible and awesome, we monkey patch constantize. More specifically, this particular one line you see there, like we wrap the existing constantize and say, okay, well, if you try to constantize a controller, actually require this controller as well. And this made the trick, everything worked, we could serve requests, everything worked fine. Um, but it had an interesting effect on our code base because now we needed to have explicit requires everywhere. And this, is, this was a constant decision in, within the team, um, but it's also not very railsy, if you want to say so. Um, what I like about it, like it makes it obvious how many dependencies my current file I'm looking at has. So I refer to this as a manual uh, static analysis. Like if you open up a file and it has like 20 require statements, it gives you at least a hint to, well, maybe this thing is doing too much. And then you can start thinking about extracting things or splitting it up in different ways. Maybe it's okay, but at least you can ha start having a conversation and think about, is this thing doing too many things? And with all these settings now configured and we were able to start a new Greenfield project, which will be our example one. So Greenfield project, we had everything at our disposal. We could do whatever we want because we were in complete control of what we want to do and how we want to approach it. So we did all these configuration settings and here's the existing or the previous application again with the six minute runtime of the suite. I was not part of the project when we kicked it off. I joined the project when there was already 5,500 specs that ran in 23 seconds. And while I don't have a percentage here, I think this is a pretty big increase, uh, decrease. Um, additionally to that, with all the tweaks about like how many files need to be loaded at the beginning, loading or testing one controller in isolation used to take around 18 seconds until you knew, okay, yep, this controller works or it doesn't work. Now with the new uh, approach and the new configuration settings, we only needed to wait two seconds, which I think is still pretty good. Um, one caveat here though is we made a co also a choice to not use active record at all. Like we switched to the SQL gem and uh, a repository pattern in that way, which it, you don't need to discard active record for that. It's mostly about that you can switch your implementations for your persistency depending on the environment you're in. So when we were testing, we had an in-memory repository in order to help us gain more speed. Um, in production, of course, we use a real repository um, that actually connected to our Postgres database, but we could still have used um, active record for that. It's just, we switched to SQL. Um, no particular reason, it's, it was just the, the, the way we started working with it. Um, it's worth mentioning here though, that this adds double burden on us. Like we needed to maintain two separate versions of, for each repository. Like we needed to maintain a Postgres implementation as well as an in-memory implementation. But the benefits for that was that we gained a lot of speed for our test suite. So it was worth for us in, uh, investing into this double maintenance. The way we did that was with shared RSpec examples that ran for both implementations. So we actually only needed to write the test once, but implement it twice, basically. Um, the second example I have was a Rails application we took over from a new client. Um, and that started with 220 gems 
and a liberal usage of active record. The application itself came with 2,600 tests, out of which were 730 controller tests, and the rest of them were not just plain old Ruby object tests, they were a bunch of um, cucumber tests, uh, no, capybara tests, as well as tests that integrated or verified some elastic search behavior, as well as verifying that the sidekick job was kicked off. So it wasn't just controller and the regular Ruby world. And the full suite ran in around eight and a half minutes. So we thought, okay, let's optimize it our way in order to gain more speed. And running a single controller with the existing application, with the required Rails all the way, um, took around 14 seconds in that case. After we did all the um, configuration changes and all the required statements, because now we actually needed to add all required statements manually back into the code base, which weren't there before because it was a regular Omakase Rails application. Um, we were only to cut it, able to cut it down to nine seconds. Still a little bit better, but not the benefit we uh, had before. And for a non-controller spec, it looked a little bit better. If we were running a single non-controller spec, it took around six and a half seconds. Um, and we were able to cut this down at least to around half a second. So there was more um, optimizations. Uh, that was a better optimization for us than with the controller test, but um, we weren't able to just apply it throughout the whole code base because manually adding all required statements took a lot of effort. I did all the benchmarking for two controllers, and at the end of it, I had, uh, like my git status showed me I had 150 files changed. So, because it's a client project, we can't build, like we can't build a client for refactorings that we wanted to do for refactoring's sake. So we would need to find a way to slide it in as we add more features. Um, so we couldn't just flip the switch and say, "Yep, now your application is faster and we have a better uh, development experience." But we could um, do some projections. So um, around. Um, eight and a half minutes was the previous um, runtime for the suite. And with the knowledge about, like, it's not just controller tests and non controller tests for us, um, we projected numbers that we were able to cut it down to at least five to six minutes, which is still fairly long, too long for my own taste, but a little bit better than before. And With all the changes and all the explicit requires, um, I know that not many people would agree with me. The main point I'm trying to make here is that launching a test suite should not be a daunting task. You should, you, you want to be able to run your test suite multiple times a minute to get this fast feedback. And if you only take one thing away from this talk is split up your spec helpers. Split your spec helpers in a spec helper that has um, just that just loads our spec and maybe define some global um, uh, test helpers that you want to be using throughout your test suite and a separate Rails spec helper that requires the existing spec helper and also requires the Rails environment. This way you have, this is a really low hanging fruit in order to at least optimize all your non-Rails tests. Like if you just test a um, class that does not require anything from Rails, you get a huge speed benefit. Um, having said all of that, let's talk a little bit about the Rails way. So what does this actually mean? In Rails' doctrine, we can read that there is, uh, that we value convention over configuration. We made a very conscious decision in our team that we favor explicitness over implicitness. I like to read explicit and boring code. Like magic code does not, I, I'm not a, I, I don't really like it, that doesn't mean that I don't like Rails, but it's just I favor explicit code over knowing that, okay, something will be loaded and something will be done for me in the background. And it's worth mentioning that conventions are heuristics. They are not rules. You can break them. And if you learn something new, you might even realize, um, well, this convention we used to follow for three years, maybe it's not a convention anymore. We should use something else, and it's not a bad thing. This comes... Uh, 
the 8020 rule applies here again. Like all these conventions we find in Rails work very, very well for 80% of Rails apps out there. But the remaining 20% might need something else, and that is fine. It's not bad. And it doesn't mean that Rails is not the right fit for them. It's just that Rails still offers enough flexibility in order to support the remaining 20%. You just need to maybe work a little bit harder to reap these benefits. So I mentioned it earlier, I want to talk a little bit about general architecture as well. And while I'm not, I don't want to bore you with 1970s material about what software architecture should look like, there are a couple more recent architectures out there. First one is clean architecture, which defines some entities in the core of the application that will be orchestrated by so-called use case implementations. And then these use cases will be exposed through controllers in our Rails app application, for example, through the web. Um, in a similar vein, there is a thing called hexagonal architecture um, coined by Alistair Coburn, which goes in a similar direction. Like at the core of your application is your actual, actual application, and you provide different adapters for different clients. Like you can have a GUI adapter in order to connect the Qt GUI to it, or an HTTP adapter to connect maybe a browser to it. Like think of Rails here. And these adapters do not only work for like inbound um, connections, also for outbound connections. Like you have an adapter in order to connect to your persistence layer, Postgres or MySQL, or you have an adapter for uh, a REST adapter that connects to Salesforce, for example. And last but not least, um, in Martin Fowler's book, Patterns of Enterprise Application Architectures, this is a thing called service layer. Same idea again, you have a user interface that connects to a service layer which guards your domain model which then it in itself has access to this, it's called data source layer here, it's your database at the end of the day. And when we look at these three architectures, they look very, very similar. They all have the same idea behind them and it's not something completely new even because if we take the service layer as an example and we focus on one particular area and we zoom in on that, it's pretty much a layered architecture again, like nothing new to learn here. We are back in the future, back in the 90s. Um, it's fine, like uh, new words for old concepts, like isolate the application from the outside world. That's pretty much it. It's important to remember though that Rails is not your application. And this is why I was emphasizing on the ar um, architectures a little bit. And I wanna show you an example uh, of a uh, pictures e-commerce platform here. Like in an e-commerce platform, we might have a user class that if user logs in, we have a customer class representing this particular user. And a user can have a basket. A basket can consist of a couple of products and each product has a category. And while we're checking out, um, we need to select a delivery method as well as a payment method. And at the end of the payment process, we get an invoice as a PDF download, for example. And this is our core application. Like we don't see a controller there, we don't see a session hash or any gnarly rails or web details. Like this is the core of our application. And this goes in the direction of um, domain-driven design, a book I highly recommend to read. Um, and in order to tie that back to the um, architecture we saw before, let's have a look how that applies to our Rails application, how that would apply to our Rails application. So if we start from top to bottom, our user interface is usually a browser. And this browser connects through HTTP to our Rails application or our checkout controller. And the checkout controller then translates this web request to a thing called our checkout, which is our use case implementation in this instance. And the checkout process, uh, the checkout use case then mediates uh, between several domain model objects, which ideally should just be plain old Ruby objects that define some behavior. And then at the end, it will create an order which is, or which acts as our gateway to our database. And this is pretty much it. Like top down, one request comes in and you might have uh, something new in the database. How does that tie back to Rails' MVC idea? 
MVC has become this more of an abstract concept than a design pattern or anything like that. Um, and we've seen that a couple of years back in the Rails community even, um, where there was talk about, oh yeah, we should favor fat models over sk uh, to skinny controllers until we realized, okay, these models get really, really hard to test. So we went to the other extreme and said, okay, let's keep the models really thin and put all the behavior into controllers, which made it really hard to test the controllers. And the, it's not enough to only think or talk about these three buckets, because I see this as a balloon that you just squeeze on one end. You're not magically um, removing air or responsibilities from, from things. Um, you're just squeezing it here, with, and it will expand the balloon on the other side. So it's important to not think about um, or focus on skin or fat anything. We should focus on healthy everything because spreading the responsibilities into small chunks will help us make, create an easier to understand code base. Like if we only worry about classes that have five to 10 lines, it's really, really, it should be easier to understand than following a 50 method long um, method, for example. Um, and when I was preparing this talk, I had a chat with a friend over coffee and I was going through the topics uh, and areas I want to discuss with him and he was asking me, okay, so we did this type of Rails style for a couple of years now and he was asking, would you do it again? Would you still do all your Rails applications like this? And I was thinking a moment and I thought, well, all the preloading and loading optimizations, yes, for sure. But the idea with the um, screaming architecture, like removing the app directory and moving everything into lib, probably not. I think this is utterly overrated um, because if we think back to the default directory structure, um, I don't necessarily need to know that this is a movie organization database or uh, e-commerce platform for flowers or something like that. It's okay to start with, okay, it's a Rails application and if I want to know more, I probably look into lib or if there's a source directory, there's source and then I have my nice namespaced responsibilities laid out there. Um, and with the separation of concerns or like separating your application from everything that is Rails specific, I actually like the idea to have these physically separated now. Like my core application is in lib. Nothing Rails specific should leak into lib. Everything Rails and web related should stay in app. Like this makes it not trivial, but at least easier to upgrade Rails as well, because we don't need to worry about anything that is in lib. Maybe we wrap some active um, job dependencies inside lib, but this is really about it. Lib is our application. Nothing of Rails should leak in there. <clears throat> so everything comes with a trade-off, right? I'm not trying to sell you the promised land here. Like it's not that magically all of a sudden we will end up writing more and more awesome Rails apps. Um, there are trade-offs and there are hard trade-offs you make. For example, explicit requires. This is something that is not necessarily um, used in a typical res application. And if you take back the city example or the city metaphor at the beginning, like we put up some big construction sites and just cut through a couple of blocks, not without thinking, but it, we need to be aware that it comes with the cost because we need to remember like we work in teams usually and we're not an island, right? It needs to be a team decision because at the end of like, in the end, it's the team's effectiveness is more important than our own idealistic view of how an application should be structured. Because at the end of the day, that is a technical detail. Whether a file for a controller lives in this directory or that directory, who cares really? Would I start every project like this now with this new approach? Probably not. I would wait until I, um, until I feel the pain of having a slow test suite and then worry about, okay, how can I optimize this? 
for example, if I would put up a Rails application for people to sign up for my birthday party that I will put on a free tier Heroku Dino, scaffold the hell out of it and deploy it and call it a day. It's really, it's really thinking about how much maintenance do you expect for this particular pro uh, problem and how much benefit do you get from all these um, optimizations. And we should remember to not just follow whatever has been done before us. Question things, break things, fix them again, but break things and question things. Like take the Leaning Tower of Pisa, for example. It's a great attraction. It is massive amount of people go there every year. Is that an indicator that we should build every tower like this now? Probably not. And last but not least, or more importantly, know your tools, like know why you follow certain rules, but also know why and when to break them. Make it a conscious decision. And on that note, I think it's the time, all right. I will leave some room for some questions, but first say thank you for listening to me. <laughs>